very exciting and varied lineup for you this evening. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker, uh, Dr. Killian de Gascon. Uh, Killian is the director of the National Virus Reference Laboratory. He's the chair of the SARS uh, COVID-2 Expert Advisory Group and a member of the National Public Health Emergency Team. And Killian is going to talk to us about COVID-19 and vaccines. Killian, floor is yours. Great stuff. Uh, thanks, Brian, and thank you to the Society for the invitation to speak here this evening. Um, I will, let's go back to the start. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you this evening about uh, SARS coronavirus type 2 and vaccination. Um, and I suppose try and give you a brief overview as to where we are in the country at the moment and, and perhaps uh, an indication of, of what the future might hold. So just a, a brief um, overview of what we've been talking about, a little bit of uh, vaccinology, some virology as a, as a virologist, I suppose that's the bit that I find most interesting, um, to touch on the vaccines that we have currently available and then some of the future challenges. So as, you, as you'll all be familiar, vaccines have transformed public health really with a, an estimated two to three million lives saved each year by current immunization programs, according to the World Health Organization, and have played a significant role in, in child mortality, reducing from about 93 per thousand live births in 1980 uh, to under 40 um, uh, per, live, per thousand uh, live births in 2018. So vaccines really at their, in their basic form exploit the, the ability of our immune system to respond to and to remember encounters with pathogen antigens. And this was an antigen is just a part of a pathogen. So a pathogen can be a virus, a bacterium or a fungus. Um, and an antigen is a part of that pathogen, typically a, a protein or a polysaccharide that is recognized by the immune system. So in its simplest form, it's a, it's a biological product that can be used to safely induce an immune response that confers protection against either infection and or disease on subsequent exposure to a pathogen. So it's the safest way of, of acquiring immunity. So the thing about the vaccine is that it must contain antigens that are either derived from the pathogen or produced synthetically to represent components of, of the pathogen. And protection conferred by a vaccine is measured in clinical trials that relate immune responses uh, to the antigen to, to clinical endpoints. So that they'll typically look at either infection rates or disease severity or hospitalization or mortality. So with something like SARS coronavirus type 2, where um, mortality happens fairly quickly, um, you can measure all of those things. But say for different things, say like the, the hepatitis B vaccine, where you're looking at an impact on perhaps liver cancer or mortality in that context, you need to look for surrogates of protection. And we typically use, look at the, um, the antibody level to epi surface antigen. There are lots of different types of, of vaccines, which um, I'm not gonna go through today, but obviously our, our seasonal influenza vaccine is a, an, a, an inactivated uh, whole virus particle in essence that we use. Um, if we look at things like the diphtheria and tetanus pertussis, they're, they're toxoid based. And then the HPV vaccine that we're more familiar with now is a, is a virus-like particle. And then down at the bottom, the two that I've marked here in green are, are the viral vector vaccine and nucleic acid vaccine, which uh, we're, I'll be talking about today in the context of SARS coronavirus type 2. Um, and the beauty of these uh, vaccines is that they're, they're gene-based, so they induce a, a very broad immune response when they get into the human body. So I, I'm not an immunologist, so I'm not going to go into this slide in, in great detail, but I suppose what I want to highlight here is that broadly speaking, there are two components to the immune system, the humoral immune response, which is antibody based, and then the cellular response. So ideally, when you're developing a vaccine, what you want to see is uh, both components of the immune system activated, because that allows you to have a, a long lived memory response as well as a, a, an acute response to, to the vaccine itself. So the adaptive immune response is mediated by B cells that produce the, those antibodies. So that's the humoral element and then T cells. So we know that antibodies are important in vaccine induced protection. And we take that from a variety of different settings. We see it in immunodeficiency, in complemented mediated killing. We see it in passive protection. So if people, you know, we know that if people are administered varicella zoster immunoglobulin or intravenous immunoglobulin, it kind of a, a therapeutic effect and it can prevent infection. Um, and also we know from immun immunological data that say that polysaccharide vac vaccines work on the basis of an antibody response. 
But antibodies alone are not sufficient typically to, to resolve an infection, so they still need help. And that help comes from the cellular immune response. So again, we see it, uh, the example in natural infection where T cell deficiency results in failure to control um, varicella zoster, for example. So in its simplest terms, and again, I stress that I'm not an immunologist, Antibodies have a major role in, in the prevention of infection and they get help from uh, T helper cells in that context. And then cytotoxic T cells are required though to control and clear established infection. And as I said, when we're developing a new vaccine, ideally we want to see both arms of the immune response activated. So to come to the, the pathogen, I suppose we're talking about today, which is SARS coronavirus type two, you'll all be familiar now with the, the background story in the first announcement on the 31st of December, 2019. So the novel coronavirus, which at that stage was, was termed 2019 NCOV was announced as the causative agent on the 7th of January last year. And what was really important was that the viral genome sequence was released for immediate public health support. And that was available on the 10th of January. And then four other genomes were deposited shortly thereafter on the 12th to the WHO Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data. So this is where all of our sequence data is shared in the public domain so people can analyze the spread and evolution of the virus over time. So the availability of the sequence was really important because it allows the first diagnostic assay to be published on later in January that month by Corman and colleagues because PCR assays are specific to the pathogen, so you need to know the sequence of what you're looking for. And then the other benefit was that we know that the first messenger RNA was sequenced in, in the days and weeks immediately following publication of the viral genome. So really the, the vaccines that we're reaping the benefit of now, the, the work on those started pretty much straight away, just, uh, just under 12 months ago. So this is a schematic of the SARS coronavirus type 2 genome up at the top. And really the piece we want to focus in on today is the spike gene, or which is labeled there as S, one of the structural proteins. And then the bottom of this slide just demonstrates the relationship between SARS coronavirus type 2 and other coronaviruses with, with which we're, we're familiar. We have a number of seasonal coronaviruses. And then obviously we've had the original SARS back in 2002, 2003, and MERS in 2012. This is a, a diagram of the structure of, SAR, of all coronaviruses, in fact, and the piece that, we're that I'm targeting or that I want to focus on today really is the spike like a protein because that's the bit that you'll all have heard about in the context of, of vaccinology. So that's uh, a protein that is required for the entry of the, the virus into the cell and it binds to um, human ACE2 our human angiotensin, convert angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 on the surface of our cells and that's how the virus gets into our cells. Spike protein itself is obviously quite complex. It's, a, it's formed of a, a trimer. So there are three, verse, there are three copies of, of the molecule um, in the spike protein. And there are two subunits, S1 and S2, that form the spike protein. And the spike attaches to the host cell receptor and then facilitates fusion of the, the virus envelope with our cell membrane. And that's what allows the genetic material from the virus to get into our cells. So this is the spike protein and it's more... Um, I suppose complicated forms on the left hand side. This is the uh, closed version, and the, the three different colors there refer to the, the three different copies of, of the spike protein that go to form um, the, the structure itself. And then on the right hand side, in the open form, we can see that the receptor binding domain has opened to allow the uh, virus to bind to the human host cell receptor. So we know from, or it was known rather, that from studies with the original SARS coronavirus that the spike protein was the main antigen that both in inducing high tight or neutralizing antibodies and also in eliciting protective immunity against infection in animal studies. So when SARS coronavirus type 2 came along and people were starting to make vaccines. There had been work done on the original SARS and also on MERS coronavirus type 2 uh, in 2012 that allowed for as well as us to hit the ground running in some respects. So obviously you'll all be aware that there's been a massive interest in, in vaccines for, for SARS coronavirus type 2, so I'm not going to go through those in detail, but it's, it's really been a fascinating um, year and, incre and an incredible sort of scientific achievement over the last 12 months. Um, so now a nice sort of overview of just the way the different um, coronavirus vaccines can work or different vaccine principles in general. So the green arrow in the middle there highlights the two that we're going to talk about now. We've got nucleic acid vaccines, which can be RNA or DNA. Obviously, we've two messenger RNA vaccines um, in circulation and use in Ireland. And then below that, we've got the viral vector vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca, the Oxford group um, in the chimpanzee adenovirus vector. So we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. 
So these are the three that we have from Pfizer BioNTech. Um, conditional marketing authorization was granted by the European Commission on December 21st. The Moderna vaccine, uh, which takes its name, which deliberately contains mRNA in its name, uh, had its conditional marketing authorization granted on January 6th. And then AstraZeneca had their authorization granted on January 29th. And it really is phenomenal um, 12 months on that we have three vaccines uh, widely available and, and already in use given where we where we've come from. So the messenger RNA vaccines, these have not been in the schedule prior to this, um, but what the way they act is that they carry the genetic instruction for the host cells to make the spike protein, which is the antigen in this case, and that more closely mimics a natural infection. So the vaccine obviously can't cause the infection because it only carries instructions for the spike protein, so it doesn't make a full uh, virus particle. But when the spike protein is manufactured then by, this, by our cells, the immune system recognizes it as foreign and mounts an immune response against it. The messenger RNA is encased in a, in a lipid carrier particle, which protects it from degrading too quickly in the body because mRNA is, is quite unstable or, and degrades quite quickly. So that's obviously why we've had the, all the discussion about the complicated uh, transport, uh, the ultra cold uh, transport chain. But um, carrier particles also help the mRNA to cross the cell membrane. And then the advantages of this new approach, uh, which really could be revolutionary in terms of vaccinology for a number of different infections, uh, has advantages in including sort of a high potency, the ability of a fairly rapid development as we've seen over the last year, and the need, the ability up to upgrade it fairly quickly if needs be, and also fairly cost-effective production. There's also the potential down the line to combine multiple messenger RNAs into a single vaccine. And the advantage is that there's no risk of pre-existing immunity because there's no viral vector. So that's something we'll come to with the viral vector approach. So the data that Pfizer BioNTech presented to the European Medicines Agency demonstrated a two-dose vaccine efficacy of 95%, which really is incredible. The EU and the FDA had, broadly speaking, agreed that they would approve anything that was safe and effective with or safe and had an efficacy of greater than 50%. So to get the 95% straight out of the, the gap is just phenomenal. Uh, the high efficacy was also observed across age, sex and ethnicity character, categories and among persons with underlying medical conditions. And you'll have seen this graph, I'm sure, a number of times. So in the red line at the bottom, we have people in the uh, study group that received uh, the controls or received the placebo, so apologies, that received the vaccine. And then in the blue line, you see the placebo group. And I suppose it's always the, the thing about presenting research. It's always nice to present your data and not have to require any statistics statistical methods to, uh, to demonstrate the efficacy. So you can see the number of cases in the placebo group started to increase quite dramatically after about, about two weeks. So really striking findings for, from Pfizer-BioNTech. And then shortly thereafter, Moderna came out, they presented their data to the EMA, so they're licensed on the basis of a vaccine efficacy of 94.1% in those age, age 18 and above. And again, the efficacy was observed across the, all the various different categories that they looked at. And a similar, similar diagram again, where we can see the case numbers increase in the placebo quite dramatically after about two weeks um, and very few cases um, in the vaccinated cohort. So again, really striking results. Moving on to the viral vector, then this is the AstraZeneca vaccine. And so this is the, the, Astra, the viral vector vaccines use a virus that is non-pathogenic, so it's not causing any infection in humans. Uh, typically, it's often an adenovirus, but you can use others, and it's selected to transport key antigens into the recipient cells to evoke a, a protective immune response. So in the case of SARS coronavirus type 2, the, the genome of the vector virus is genetically modified to encode for the spike protein of SARS coronavirus type 2, which, when expressed by the host cell, provokes the immune response, stimulating and uh, neutralizing antibody production. So this is more convenient logistically, again, as people will be aware of in the context of the ultra-cold uh, transport chain, but there is the risk of an effect of pre-existing immunity to the vector. So this is the reason that the Oxford group is using a chimpanzee adenovirus vector because it's very, there's very low risk of people having been exposed to that before. And similarly, it's why Sputnik 5 uses two different adenoviruses so that you don't get um, a, you're not getting a, an immune response to your primary dose when you're trying to give your booster dose. And this, I suppose this has been learned, I suppose the, the hard way in some respects, it was a trial a, a number of years back for use uh, for HIV uh, vaccine trial. And they used a human adenovirus type 5, and they found that in people who had been exposed to the natural infection previously were actually at a greater risk of acquiring an infection with the vaccine than, than those who received the placebo. So that's why we've, we use um, vectors that uh, 
people have not been exposed to previously. So looking at the efficacy, again, people will be familiar with the, the story around AstraZeneca. The, they inadvertently had sort of a, a two-tiered approach where there was a low dose uh, standard dose of um, arm and then a, a two standard dose arm. So their, their license at the moment is based on the efficacy of the two standard dose um, administered. So the EMA has licensed it on the basis of vaccine efficacy of just 59 and half percent, but fairly wide confidence intervals between 45 and up to 70. And then as we said, there's a there was a report that the efficacy may be up to 90% in a low dose standard dose regimen. So the explanation for that finding remains unclear, which is why it hasn't been included in the licensing to date. But that phenomenon has been described previously um, with the meningococcus type C vaccine in infancy, where a lower um, initial prime dose can lead to a more robust uh, immune response when you bust, when you boost it. So unfortunately, there were insufficient clinical data to allow reliable calculation of efficacy in those aged 55 and older. And again, people will be familiar with the discussions around that. But as a similar immune response was shown in all age groups, including those 65 and older, the EMA has authorized the vaccine for all adults. And indeed, we've done the same here in, in Ireland. The World Health Organization um, as age group has subsequently reported the overall vaccine efficacy at 63.1%. So certainly uh, a difference in the context uh, when we compare it to the mRNA vaccines. But what's really important to highlight is that there have been no cases of COVID-19 hospitalization, severe disease or death in those age 65 and older who receive the vaccine. So it still seems to be incredibly efficacious. And again, if we look at the, the vaccine, um, the graph of efficacy from the trial, you can see that the placebo arm and the vaccine, the vaccinated cohort, they separate quite nicely, although perhaps quite, not quite as dramatically perhaps as the mRNA vaccine, but which is not, what is nice about this trial is that they use an opportunity rather than give a placebo, they use the opportunity to give a meningococcus ACWI um, polyvalent vaccine in their placebo arm rather than just a, a standard placebo. So what have we got coming soon? So we've the Janssen, John, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which will be coming. That's another viral vector vaccine. And that's entered a rolling review with the European Medicines Agency uh, just, I think it was last week or the previous week. Uh, there's Novavax, which is a recombinant spike protein, um, which is produced in insect cells. So that's more akin to the hep B surface antigen uh, vaccine that we have it's purely based on the protein and then there's CureVac coming down the stream as well or coming down the track which is another messenger RNA so just to look at the um, the vaccine that Novavax is using which is quite cool they've got they use a, a bacular virus to deliver spike protein DNA from the coronavirus into a uh, an army were a moth cell uh, up on the left hand side. So that moth cell then produces the spike proteins for you. And then we can harness those spike proteins and uh, sort of stud them into a synthetic particle. And then that synthetic particle with a, a pure, with a, a saponin, which is a, a, an adjuvant to boost the immune response is added. Um, and then that vaccination aims to trigger production of anti-spike antibodies. So again, a very nice, um, new sort of methodology for, for producing uh, spike proteins. And that'll be coming uh, coming soon. And the preliminary results from the efficacy for those trials are, are very promising. So what have we learned to date? So the efficacy, the good news is that the efficacy in the clinical trials is really translating to real world effectiveness. We've seen that in Israel and the UK and Scotland and England, and also even in Ireland and our own healthcare workers and in our nurse, in our residential care facilities, we're starting to see infections drop in the hospital workers who would have been vaccinated um, first. Uh, we're seeing data that the vaccine may protect against asymptomatic infection as well. It's coming from the UK SIREN study. Um, and we're seeing that there's a reduced spiral load in infected vaccinated individuals, and they appear to have a reduced duration of infectiousness. So all of those um, findings can lead us to conclude that it's likely these vaccines will have an impact on transmission as well. Now, there's no reason to think to there's no reason to believe that the vaccines wouldn't have a, an effect on transmission. But obviously, we're keen to gather the evidence and see the data so that we can make informed decisions. But the the early news is really positive in that context. There's a lot of discussion, obviously, about the single dose, uh, and that may suffice in those previously infected with SARS coronavirus type two. And again, that's fairly intuitive in some respects because you're no longer working in the realm of primary immunization what you're doing in that situation is boosting a previous immune response so it makes sense that you would uh, that a one dose might be sufficient and we'll we'll wait to see what the guidelines are around that and then there's been a, a lot of discussion about the idea of a single dose perhaps providing protection for up to three months in if there was a, a need to vaccinate large portions of the population uh, in a case of vaccine supply shortages now 
Um, certainly uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, demonstrates good efficacy up to three months, so that's not a problem, but certainly the mRNA vaccines have been licensed on the basis of, of a, up to 28 days, and the majority of people in the studies would have got their uh, vaccines in around the, the three to four week mark, so uh, I think we don't have the data to extend the duration for, for those vaccines at this stage. So just to Coming towards the end, this is a really nice slide from JAMA, which just highlights the efficacy against severe COVID. So we're obviously concerned about um, controlling infection across the board. But if you look at the percentages there under the green arrow for the va vaccines that we have now in use, and, and in addition, the Sputnik vaccine, which I haven't talked about here, pretty much the efficacy against severe COVID, including hospitalization, is really about 100%, which is, which is phenomenal. So we should really see a benefit for our, our vulnerable groups and our elderly patients um, in the coming uh, weeks and months here in Ireland as well. So there's been a lot of discussion about what proportion of the population we need to get to. Now, obviously at this stage, we've no plans to vaccinate the under 18. So that is a piece of work that needs to be done. But this is just a nice slide from uh, a publication from 2011, just talking about the herd immunity concept. So basically the herd immunity threshold is related or correlates with your, with your or not. So if we're looking at SARS coronavirus type two, we're probably in the region of a, an or not, a reproductive number of between probably in its unmitigated, in an unmitigated setting, probably somewhere between four and six, which is around here. So if we, if we move up the graph, we can see that our herd immunity threshold is probably somewhere between 75 and 85 percent but as i said at the moment we're not planning to or we don't have any recommendation around um, the vaccination of, of children and adolescents because they weren't included in the trials so that's something we'll need to look at but ultimately we've uh, our aspiration should be to get to about 75 to 80 percent 85 percent of the uh, susceptible population the susceptible adult population and um, to give us some level of, of protection in that cohort so the future challenges, as, as you would have seen, the spike protein is really, I suppose, we've gone all in on the spike protein. It's in all of our vaccines to date. So what are the spike protein changes? And that's really what we've seen over the last, uh, so it's more so the last six months as such. So I won't go into this in great detail, but these are amino acid changes that we're seeing in the variants of concern that have been reported. So there are three main variants of concern uh, based on increased transmissibility, based on potential for increased severity, and based on the fact that they may have an impact on vaccine effectiveness. So B117 was first reported in the UK, B1351 was first reported in South Africa, and P1 was then first reported in uh, Brazilians who had traveled to Japan. Uh, but in all three uh, jurisdictions, uh, these variants have become predominant uh, very quickly um, and that's demonstrating a, a, an enhanced transmissibility so you can see that the amino acid changes and i've highlighted a number of different positions there that there are similar across the board uh, and this means that if we look at the, the N501Y, it means this is probably accounting for a significant increased transmissibility um, but you can also see in the variant in B1351 and P1, you can see they share 614G, which increases transmissibility. They share E8, E484K in the spike, which has an impact on vaccine responsiveness um, and spike and um, changes at position um, K417, uh, also in the spike protein, which again, they have an impact on uh, neutralizing antibodies. And this is the concern for us now. So this is just an example from B1351, which is a South African, or the variant that was first reported in South Africa. So we're looking at the top here on the left-hand side, we're looking at the top of the spike protein and its interaction, the RBD stands to receptor binding domain. And you can see there the positions for 484, 417, and 501. So what this is, these are some data from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. So they've reported that 501Y is enhancing binding affinity to ACE2, 484K is enhancing binding affinity, but also conferring resistance to class two neutralizing antibodies, and K417N would abolish key interactions with class one anti neutralizing antibodies and likely contributes toward immune evasion. So we are concerned about these variants and there's a reason that we need to control them. It's not surprising that they would emerge over time. Viruses change and viruses evolve. And I suppose the key thing for us at the moment, we know that B117 is remains susceptible to the vaccines that we have here in Ireland. So the key thing for us is to roll out vaccination uh, as quickly and as safely as we can. But we also want to control the importation of the emerging variants of concern purely because if they were to become dominant in our population, we know that they have demonstrated an ability to, to take off even in a setting where there was presumed to be a high level of, um, 
underlying immunity based on on seroprevalence data. So as I said, it's been a, a really, um, I suppose, important uh, development. I suppose it's been a very exciting year in many respects. And just from the vaccinology perspective, we've done really well. But as I said, the virus will continue to evolve uh, and we may need to update the, the vaccines over the coming um, 12 to 24 months or thereabouts. So just to finish off the vaccine in itself, obviously it's not a silver bullet. It's, it's one more slice of cheese in the Swiss cheese um, pandemic defense and vaccines are over here on the right. And I said, no single measure is going to be perfect, but if we combine all of them together, uh, we should certainly be able to, to keep the virus, bring the virus back under control in Ireland and, uh, ho and hopefully keep it there as we roll out the vaccine program. And I will stop there and say, uh, thank you very much for your attention.